Good afternoon, everybody. Um, on behalf of the team at WiseKey, I would like to welcome you on our third webinar today. Uh, we will be talking about how to make an NFT or how to produce an NFT, the do's, the don'ts, what, um, what it should look like. Should it be animated? Should it be a JPEG, a very high definition, pic definition picture, sorry, of a still um, image? And um, to do that, we, I'd like to welcome our speakers today, Mr. Ashok Ranadiv from Casper Labs, who is based Hello. in India and who's helping us develop our new WiseArt Entrusted NFTs platform. And of course, Andreas Moreira, um, who's working closely with Ashok as well on the development of the platform. So thank you very much, both of you, for being with us today. And uh, thank you for our audience. Um, I believe it's... Uh, quite a large audience today, so welcome. Remember, you can ask questions at any time, just pop them in the Q&A section just down the bottom of your screen. And um, without further ado, let's begin. So Ashok, what, uh, you're in, how long have you been at Casper Lab and what led you to, to go into you know, IT and NFTs and the metaverse? Yeah, I, I can give you a quick, uh quick uh, background of what my journey has been and how I landed in this place. Um, by the way, I'm based out of Puerto Rico, which is uh, island island of uh, United States. Uh, it's one of the territories of the United States. Um, just, just moved here about eight months back. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I, I've been interested in technology, you know, since the very beginning, but my career started on a, a different technology route. I'm a I'm a mechanical engineer uh, undergrad, and I've done my um, postgrad in nuclear engineering. Um, I was uh, with Indian Navy for 20 years. I actually retired as a commander from Indian Navy. Um, thereafter, I did a B school and uh, joined Google in India. I was with uh, Google for 12 years, uh, India uh, for about four or five years, then uh, Singapore for three years, and then they moved me to US uh, for about four and a half, five years. Uh, sometime in uh, 2019, when it was 12 years and my kids were you know, out of, out of the house, I was kind of thinking what to do next. And blockchain came up as you know, technology area of interest. Uh, so Casper Labs happened then, you know, uh, when when Renal, our CEO and Meda, our CPO, kind of convinced me that this is the next big thing for the you know mankind. Uh, uh, so um, in in July 2019, I actually moved to Casper Labs, um, and I've been with Casper Labs uh, for now two years, two and a half years now. In Casper Labs, yeah, um, yeah, it's been a it's been a little weird journey to the technology. <laughs> it's not very straight what you see these days, right? Um, but it's been fun. Um, I take care of uh, <coughs> professional services for Casper Labs, um, Director of Professional Services, in which I uh, work with enterprises and you know strategic partners like uh, Weiss Starard, Weiss Key, uh, to develop um, unique solutions uh, for solving enterprise business problems by uh, using Casper's blockchain technology. Okay, I can well imagine being a commander on the Navy that you would have had already uh, some security issues as well within your communications and all that sort of thing. Is that correct? I mean, yes. Um, so I have to I have to keep that part of my my life in complete dark, in complete darkness, <laughs> and I don't keep, I don't peep into it. <laughs> and I don't let anybody else keep into it too much. Um, my, my wife didn't know what projects I'm working on. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> my so you fell in, the, <laughs> fell in the right place with, uh, with Weisky, who've been professionals in the 20, for 25 years in cybersecurity. Yeah, yeah. So that's cool. Um, Andreas, well, what led you? You're a, a bit of a younger generation. What led you to this world, this metaverse? Uh, yeah, thank you, Sixteen. That's correct. I mean, um, I mean, it, it's uh, fair ado. It's uh, normal, I would say. In my case, um, I had the, the lots of uh, exposure to technology since I'm a 90, 19 uh, kids baby, right? Yeah. I, I was born with the internet. I'm a digital native, and um, I've been, I've been 
you know, a lot of the time with my dad that has been working in the UN as a cybersecurity expert, and then he launched WiseKey. So obviously I was exposed to a lot of uh, cool tech when I was very young, and uh, this really shaped my interest into uh, digital um, technologies. Uh, I've, I've been doing studies in um, uh, EPFL, uh, computer science, and, and I've really, um, you know, I mean, uh, I've always been a geek playing video games, looking cool, cool tech, playing with the uh, drones and, and cool toys. And, and blockchain really caught my interest because um, I was too young to, to see the internet boom and, and come to the life of billions of people in the world. But I, I'm seeing very similar, um, very similar uh, things happening with blockchain, right? I mean, we're at the very early stage of blockchain technology. And the fact that this new technology is empowering millions and billions of people to, 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 to really not only share information as in the digital age we're doing on internet but be the owner and be the the digital bank be the 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 sole purpose of um, owning your financial freedom right on, on cryptocurrency and uh, this is a bit uh, you know like a new vision that people are, are having with the, this more like um, liberties and in, in uses this tech but um, yeah I, i've always been uh, uh, so I'm very keen to look into this and I've been working it for a few years in Wiseki to bring in this new model. And I'm, I obviously for NFTs, we're going to talk a lot about NFTs and during this uh, webinar, but um, it, it is really booming. There's a very lots of cool stuff that's happening right now. Absolutely. Thank you, um, Andreas. It's true that it's moving extremely, extremely fast. And we're looking at already 3D, you know, like we were a 2D platform now with the Web3. It's going to get even more exciting, I suppose. So um, I have to tell the audience uh, a little bit of maintenance. We are recording this uh, webinar. And so it's important that you know, we will be sharing the recordings on our social media. Uh, please don't forget to pop your questions down below. I've already got one comment from a gentleman in Paris, Thierry Salah. Hello, hello everybody. Um, so he's just saying hello. So I uh, thank you for being there, Thierry. Um, the, uh, the, at Weiski, the... Um, the WiseArt platform is fairly recent, right? So we're still in, in de uh, development phases, but we've started with our Basel and Miami week, which is the, the biggest event. And this year it's really been big on the NFTs and everything. So we've started to upload our artists. So um, what is it that you need? If you're an artist today, Andreas, and you know you decide, or like, like for example, uh, Daniel Ibarra, behind me, I have a work, Daniel Ibarra is not of the baby, I mean, he's baby boomer generation, not so much the younger generation. What would he have to do to, um, to come and see you? <laughs> what right. does it mean? Yeah, obviously. Yeah, this is very interesting. I mean, um, it is fairly easy today to create NFTs. I mean, not only with us, right, but with any partners, um, today, basically to create an NFT, you just need a media file. So it could be a JPEG, it could be a MP4. Uh, so, you know, a video, an image, um, a, a song, or it can even be text. Any media file that can be um, uh, digitalized can be created as an NFT. Um, there's a process, I mean, then it depends on the blockchain, right, they're using. So obviously we have Ethereum, we have uh, Polygon, we have uh, obviously Casper Labs that are all uh, enablers, enablers of um, creating those tokens. So the tokens, uh, usually they follow a format. Uh, for example, in Ethereum, it's called ERC721, um, which dictates the properties of the tokens. So for example, a very basic property of an NFT is by nature, they're unique. And they cannot be um, exchanged to uh, with a different one because they will always be different and they will always have unique properties that they tell them apart. So for an artist that is interested into creating those NFTs, uh, I mean, obviously you need the digital content, but then um, it's fairly easy, right? If, for example, they're on board uh, with us on Art, they have to submit then uh, all the digital files. But as well, what we're doing on, on, on Wise.art Art is um, our key differentiator is we are actually asking people to document, artists to document their uh, digital pieces. So either they're the artists or they're the owner. I mean, in some cases we have owners that, you know, they possess like some digital content or even some physical content that they wish to create as an NFT. And what we just want to have is uh, some 
proof that they're the owners of those uh, digital assets, that they can provide us with some kind of provenance information, certificate of authenticity, um, and, and even right of use, right? Uh, what we're also putting in the platform is we're putting a digital contract, whereas um, uh, the people who are purchasing the NFT have to abide, right? I mean, for example, if I buy a very cool NFT on the platform, but the user, the author doesn't want me to print this on a on a on a, a t-shirt and try to sell it this can be specified in, into a contract right that can be uh, settled into the blockchain layer as well so it's very easy they just need to contact us and we can discuss about all of the commission required yeah thank you the um wise art platform has that particularity that it is vetted by myself and a committee of experts and also um we we tend to really apply the KYC protocols, which the Swiss banks apply as well. So we know who we're dealing with, both on the uploading side and on the on the side of those who access the the, uh, the gallery, if you like, and the and the um, and who want to buy. Ashok, what would you say is easiest to or is more appealing and attractive? Do you think it's a still image or do you think it's an animated image? What, what's the trend? Well, before before I, I jump to uh, you know uh, your question, uh, I would like to um, add to what Andrea has been saying, um, and 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 this is a whole new world for artists, right? My wife is an artist, so I know, um, and she's she's from the older generation, as you mentioned, sixteen. So she she paints with the paintbrushes and you know palette in her hand. Um, uh, it is it is important, and what we believe in Casper Labs is that um, you know I and the technology should be invisible. That means we should not be uh, we should not we should make it so easy for the end users that they don't they don't see what is happening in the background and how complex the technology is. The use should be extremely easy, and that's been the endeavor. Um, ever since you know the company uh, has been formed, Though that's one of the ethos of. Um, if you if you talk to our CTO or our CEO, you you will hear that very often. <clears throat> that make a technology that is invisible to the end user. We, you don't even realize that you know you're dealing with a complex technology, and that's important, particularly for um, artists who are coming from the earlier generation because they they haven't dealt with uh, with with uh, the kind of tools that are available now, mm -hmm. um, you know, and 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 I think um, you know the the, the great work that White Art Art is doing, you know, and and what we have been focused on as well is to kind of facilitate that. You know, again, the end product should be such that uh, people should the artist should be able to use it, whether they are from new digital age or from the earlier age, they should be able to use it seamlessly. So, I just wanted to add that. In terms of <clears throat> What type of NFT is attractive? I think, I think it is very important to be open to ideas. And um, uh, the whole, uh, and, and 16, you are from the art background. I have, been, I have observed it a little bit, but I'm not like a core art person, right? I'm a- You're I'm just a married into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, what I, what I understand is um, artists are an expression of what's going on in the society. Uh, what, what is, wh how a, a society is developing and want to express itself. And that would change, uh, you know, um, with generations. I think the new generations is very expressive in different ways. And uh, <coughs> from a technology perspective, it is important for us to give them the tools and the ability to express in a way that they want to. So whether it's an NFT, which is just a JPEG, or whether it's a, you know, a GIF or animated or a 3D, uh, a 3D art, uh, things are now possible uh, mm -hmm. on, on, on the digital platforms. And it is important for us to be able to uh, make it easy for the artists uh, to express themselves in the kind of medium uh, or, or uh, um, form they want.
Yeah, absolutely. And this is a good cue because I was going to ask you as well. I think it's a new medium uh, for artists to express themselves and as photography was and then as video was when that first came out. But I was going to ask you about sounds. That's what I was saying. That's a good cue there, your phone. But um, what do you think? Should um, Is it more difficult to upload something with sound, with an audio uh, component? No, I mean, uh, it, the beauty of technology today, and Andreas will, will vouch for me here, is it doesn't really matter. You know, if as long as you can express um, a particular um, content in any digital form, um, you can you can put it as an NFT and it becomes immutable. Uh, it is unique because it's a non-fungible token. It has all the metadata <coughs> that you would like to associate with it. Um, so uh, 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 a music file is a different type of file. Other than that, it's a, it's a digital content. It has a it's unique footprint and a fingerprint. Um, I, so, there, is, there is absolutely no reason to, to uh, keep that away from um, uh, NFT creation. Okay, all right. And Andreas, will our platform be able to support any, any type? Like it can be a very heavy file or it can be a more simple file or lighter? Right. So, I mean, as the type of files goes, as I explained earlier, is that we are intending to accept any file that can be, you know, judged as digital content. Uh, there will be still like a vetting process, as you explained uh, before. We're not going to put anything, any, you know, like either fake, um, uh, fake uh, uh, art pieces or even like... Uh, you know, people who stole art pieces. This is something we're verifying. Those who have to be careful. But um, as for the, let's say, more technical aspect, uh, as the limit, obviously there will be some limit. Um, we, I know for a fact that um, some artists uh, uses very high resolution videos and uh, high, even the high resolution pictures um, that can easily go in the gigabytes. Um, so for uh, you know. Uh, reasons that uh, we cannot uh, obviously accept su such large files, we're still going to have like some limits. So um, we're we're currently, I think, accepting uh, up to 200 megabytes for uh, files. So those files are, are intended to be uh, only accessible for the end user, the one that will uh, own the digital asset. There will be um, slightly compressed versions of the NFTs on the platform. I mean, slightly, again, they will be in very high quality. This is for multiple reasons. One, for performance reasons, so that um, the user doesn't have to, uh, you know, have very slow loading pages, but as well to keep the original um, NFT only for the eyes of the, the, the purchaser. Cool, that's very good to know. Um, I also would like to say, uh, yeah, as the art director of the Wise Art Platform, we've been approached by so many different people like museums who are digitalizing and archiving, not so much because they want to sell their works, but the NFT is a way to be interactive with their audience and to be, of course, you know, like active in, in, in today's world, but also to raise funds for future exhibitions or also to keep it for their for their. Um, conservation to see if they're doing work or not on the on the you know on the particular piece or restoration work that can all be then inscribed on the blockchain. So there's many uses for this new technology. I'm just going to go. We have one question from Dinesh. Thank you very much for being here, Dinesh. Number question uh, question number one would be with Ethereum two point launching two point oh launching soon. Will it be much quicker than the other platforms like Algo, for example? The current Ethereum performs at 15 transactions per second, which is now considered slow. So how are we doing in that respect? So I, I believe on Ethereum 2.0, I believe it's a, there's a multiple uh, steps of this specific project. Um, it is true that currently it's quite slow. It's a proof of work uh, blockchain currently. So it's like Bitcoin, they're, they're using mining with the um, graphic cards, right? To validate those blocks. So it's fairly um, slow and, and it takes a lot of time to validate those transaction at the benefit that uh, those transactions are pretty secure. Um, what Ethereum is doing is they're moving to proof of stake, which will uh, bypass this mining. It, it will, people, the new miners, in fact, they will stake their own cryptocurrencies, right, to validate transactions. So this will, this will, uh, I think, already um, uh, uh, increase the the ratio of number of transactions. I think by 
maybe 50 or 60. If you, if you look at different um, proof of stake um, blockchains, usually you're in the 50s um, transaction per second. I think as well, um, Ethereum, they're, they're, what they're going to do, they're going to implement sharding. So, I mean, I'm not going to go too much into details, but I don't want to bore, bore you with the details. The idea is that it will divide the amount of transactions to be verified among the participants. So lots of transactions can be verified more quickly. Um, but then again, we have to look into the security aspects if this is going to, it's still going to be very secure. Compliance, yeah. I, I would love to add to what Andreas was, was, was mentioning here. If you really look at Ethereum's roadmap, uh, Ethereum 2.0 is, is still uh, proof of work. It's kind of using proof of stake somewhere, but it's not it's not a complete proof of stake, right? It's not really made any difference, significant difference to uh, their uh, their throughput. Ethereum 3.0, uh, and and you know what, one thing really important to first acknowledge is that the whole NFT industry and what we see today, um, there has to be a credit given to Ethereum and and the work that they have done, right? They opened up this. A uh, very new aspect of this industry and what we are have today, uh, it's definitely uh, the credit uh, goes to Ethereum. At the same time, though, the technology is old now. If if you really look at, there are several aspects now that we need to be carefully. Um, we need to be. Uh, we need to understand carefully. One is um, in in Ethereum's roadmap. Um, if you look at uh, Casper and you know, we are already at Ethereum 3.0 not even 2.0, we are at 3.0, which is a full proof of stake implementation uh, using um, you know, WebAssembly uh, and, and uh, a smart contracting, a better smart contracting platform. And that is gonna take another couple of years. Uh, you know, that's, that's been getting delayed. It might take uh, Ethereum about two to three years to actually reach where we already are. Um, that's crazy. Um, <laughs> I mean that's how technology works, right? You know, uh, the, the 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 younger generation uh, is faster, more nimble, uh, and quicker. Um, the other thing is the ability to uh, develop smart contracts, right? Like yeah, if you're working with Ethereum, you work with Solidity. You need to know that language. You need to have developers who know that language. The pool gets limited. Um, working with uh, you know proof of stake network like uh, Casper, you have you know, ability to work in the latest, uh, you know, software like Rust uh, to create your smart contracts. And we have, you know, SDKs, which are every language like JavaScript, Java, C++, Python, Golang, uh, you know, you, you can interact with the blockchain using any of these. So it immediately increases the pool of software and developers <coughs> that you're dealing with and reduces your risk, the key man risk that you have. Oh, I'm dependent on one, software developer, and if that person leaves, I'm stuck. Uh, it, it's a situation if you're dealing with solidity because that's kind of a unique uh, skill um, and not many people know it. And the third aspect, which is very important and, and, and you know, particularly for artists is uh, the, the proof of work is, is not good for environment, right? Uh, there are environmental concern and the power consumption is incredibly high. Um, this is uh, this is particularly the younger generation and artists are very conscious of um, you know environmental and sustainability goals. Um, all indeed. the brands are very conscious. If you compare Ethereum with Casper, and and there are you know we've done the done the research and the data, we have several hundred thousand times more efficient because the the logic is um, the the power of computing is actually going towards. Uh, the computation that is required to be done and not uh, creating, um, you know, uh, solving a, a math puzzle to secure the network. The security of the network is, is ensured by the stake that the nodes are providing, which is an economic security. So there yeah. is uh, the fundamental change uh, there in, in the way, you know, we are looking at. And then I think, I think there are options available and you don't have to hold your breath for Ethereum 2.0, 3.0. Okay, that's a good answer. Uh, Dinesh, I hope we've covered you. You've got another <clears throat> question which would um, be addressed to both of you um, about music NFTs along with fractional royalties. In particular, will Weisky be able to support music NFTs? Yeah, I think we will, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I have to detail my answer too much. Yeah, obviously, this is uh, one of the aspects we would like to see. I think it's very cool that some um, independent artists, instead of seeking a, a label or it can be a painstaking you know, process, they, they go and, and you know, uh, upload their, their pieces as NFTs. This could be very fun, I think, for the music industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and there is another part to uh, Dinesh's question. He's talking about fractional royalties distribution. So um, if, we, if we look at uh, the current implementation of ERC721 on Casper uh, blockchain, uh, the NFT and uh, you know, we, we have a comprehensive solution of NFT, KYC contract, as well as auction contract, right? And <coughs> so the way it has been implemented is um, royalties can be distributed uh, through the smart contract, uh, you know, at, at at the time the purchase is executed or the auction uh, is complete. So uh, a big uh, capital yes there uh, for, for uh, implementing automatic um, distribution of royalties. Yeah, I think it will also be a, a huge collectible. There's a, that collectible aspect to it and a lot of people will adhere to that. I mean, uh, Again, back in for us baby boomers, the uh, you know the vinyls, which are by the way all coming back. I wish I hadn't gotten rid of my collection, but I mean there was that idea that you had all these, you know, collectible pieces, and it's the same with uh, in that respect with uh, basketball and the you know the hot shots and that sort of thing. People tend to like to collect things, and I think the NFTs is the perfect medium to do that. We we have another question: Will Weiski have their own tokens within their wallet? He, um, Dinesh again feels like everybody uh, within this space has tokens. My 10 year old neighbor has his own gaming token and it trades for $0.125 within the market of a $750,000 cap. So, um, so poor Dinesh fell, feels left behind. Don't worry, you're not alone, Dinesh. <laughs> I'm also way behind there. So what is that? Why, why you know, how does that happen? What's, what's the pricing? How does one do the pricing? Well, first of all, um, you know, good job on your neighbor. <laughs> you already <laughs> understood how, how this is working. I mean, the pricing, um, I don't know about the pricing. It, it's very obviously, the, the way market caps works can be sometimes misleading. Um, for example, if, if I issue, um, let's say, a $1 trillion um, token, uh, um, a number of tokens, and, I, and I'm able to trade one of those tokens with someone uh, for $1, well, technically, the valuation of this one trillion token will be one trillion dollars, right? Um, I think the, the the very important metric, right, that we have to pay in mind is as well volume to see how many actual traders and how many people are, um, you know, like training this specific token to see the interest. But uh, I mean, I'm not going to go much more in details with this. I'm going to go more to the first question was if Voiceki is going to have their own token for the platform. I mean, the answer is yes. We we won't have it currently now because obviously we're 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 really focused into bringing the the marketplace into into fruition to have lots of um, uh, artists uh, working with us to have very cool uh, technology partners like casper labs working with us to propose a very cool mechanism uh, uh, that we can only afford with some of those uh, blockchains and yes uh, we we have a roadmap in our future we have a, a token integration to have uh, even more uh, very cool stuff that will be unlockable for the token holders for the platform Cool, that sounds good. Um, I can say that we've already got a few artists now uploaded on the platform. We've got some animation. We've um, also uh, worked with a few artists who are going to get inspired by uh, archival or items with archive value. For example, uh, you know, parchments from museums or um, you know, intric I mean, like unique uh, papers from the Red Cross, things like that. So. And these artists are very creative in order to make that piece again collectible. So you'll have the physical piece and then you'll have that digital piece. One of them is Pedro Sandoval. He's currently working on a very, very um, uh, prominent uh, collection in Spain of old masters. So, you know, we're very excited about that. So watch this space. Um, we have another question from Gianluca. Thank you for being there. Um, He's, well, it's more like a comment. He says the NFTs may assist in promoting bands. 
Um, I know that Gianluca is in the music industry, so that's where that question is coming from. So um, it hasn't, uh, bands that haven't received high volumes of clicks so far on the normal streaming services. So yes, NFTs can be another tool actually to, um, to get visibility. Yeah? yeah. Okay. My next question to you two would be what, what's the blockchain? Can you explain to us a little bit? So once you've done your NFT, what happens? It's sold. And then what happens? So, so as for the, the life cycle of the NFT itself? Yeah. So, I mean, pretty much uh, the cycle continues, right? Um, the new owner will possess an NFT and, you know, they can do lots of things with it. They can just keep it for safekeeping for later. Um, you have to think that some people, they do this for um, uh, profits. They, they're traders. They, they try to to swap uh, NFTs um, uh, depending on what's the hottest NFT that's on the market and, and do it for profit. Some people, they just do it because they actually and genuinely care about the art and they wish to expose it and to participate in this new phenomenon where they can be the sole and provable owner of a digital asset. Um, we have been we have been discussing with lots of very cool uh, technology partners. Uh, one of them, uh, I won't say the name, but for, for example, they're specialized into uh, displaying those NFTs into very high definition uh, screens. Uh, as far as in the gallery, for example, I mean, they're very specialized on this and they can even like give you the, the certificate of ownership of an NFT. Uh, this can be view, uh, viewed on the TV screen. I mean, there's so many things that can be done, right, uh, with NFT. Uh, we, there's lots of stuff about the metaverse. Um, some people, they love the idea. Some people, they, they despise it. I mean, it's, it's, very, it's a very interesting concept. But I, I do think that uh, it is somehow where we're setting on in the future. Um, not necessarily in the short term, but uh, in the next few years, next few decades, I do think we'll all have a kind of metaverse presence as we do have currently with uh, normal uh, internet um, presence uh, via social media, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is, how expensive is it? For example, as you said, Ashok, I'm from the art world. So I know people who buy because they like art, like uh, like um, Andreas was saying, other people buy for investment and put it in the free port. But at the end of the day, the physical piece needs to be stored somewhere in uh, proper conditions, which is usually a little bit more expensive than the humid cellar downstairs. And um, you need to be insured, you need to have, do all sorts of things, protect it for, from light and all that. Obviously, on, on the digital world, that doesn't happen. So once you've got your NFT collection and uh, it's on the blockchain, does it cost you anything? Um, it, it would depend on um, certain parameters. Uh, the storage on chain does cost you, but it also depends on the way um, the costs are implemented on the chain, right? Um, Currently, if you look at, and that, that's one of the unique propositions and differentiators um, also for, for, for uh, new generation blockchains like Casper Labs, right? Uh, Casper, um, so the transaction fees are the fees to deal with NFTs are extremely high at this point in time on Ethereum. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's really high uh, to a level where it's actually um, um, not helping with the growth of the industry in spite of so much of, uh, you know, push uh, and, and demand from the market and, and from the users, uh, the, the, the trading fees are very high and they are halting uh, or obstructing the growth of the technology and, and the users. But new generation blockchain like Casper network, uh, the, 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 the fees are extremely low, like they are in sub cents, a fraction of a cent. And that is um, helping, you know, the moment you remove um, a, a, a extra fees and, and make it more accessible to people. Um, and, and that's, I think, the beauty of the, um, you know, the chain. Mm -hmm. I think the, the expenses associated with uh, NFT are, are several thousand times less as compared to what a physical art would might need, uh, definitely. And as Andrea has mentioned, there is provenance that is uh, that is uh, you know associated with NFT. So you you have the the proof of uh, ownership uh, attached to the NFT as long as you keep your keys safe. Um, <laughs> you know uh, you, you're not going to lose it, um, and it's 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 the beauty of the digital world. Yeah, yeah, but definitely you know um, the the 
the fees are extremely low, at least in Casper, they are in like fraction of a cent at this moment in time. And we are also working on some uh, some innovation uh, to reduce it even further. Okay, is that also something geographical? I mean, I you know we have all known. I've worked in banks before as well as in the art world, and uh, like the help desk is always located in India. So <laughs> if, if whenever we have a question, it goes back to <clears throat> Mumbai or somewhere else. Um, is that is it low because the workforce is cheaper or? has nothing to do with it i i wouldn't say it is so the improvement in technology always brings down costs um you know that's one of the purpose otherwise why will the technology be adopted right uh, you, you 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 you're bringing down cost to the end user that's really important um i think people go to india because the talent is available you know if yeah, you want to move true. that operation somewhere else the, you don't have people to, <laughs> to get your work done <laughs> so uh I think it is important to like um, understand uh, from a from a user perspective what is it that you are looking for, right? There are many platforms, and uh, you know, as Wise Art has established itself as um, you know something where KYC is associated, where the ownership is guaranteed and authenticated and checked. It is important to establish what is your differentiator in the market where you are going. Uh, there are many players uh, out there, and and you know, for for an artist, um, they should be then choosing, you know, what's what's their their preference, what is it that they are looking for. Yeah. The underlying blockchain provides the the security and ability to transact. Um, it is important. It it would be difficult for artists maybe to think and go through all the details of smart contracts and you know understand what is it. So I think that's a role that um, you know the platforms like Wise Art Art would play. That that becomes opaque to uh, the artists; they don't have to worry about it. No, so when Wise Art Art is working with Casper Network, they are guaranteed that the security is guaranteed, right? Because there are s several, you know, the stake. If you look at is it several um, billions of dollars of stake uh, in, in, in ensuring the security of the. Uh, of the network yeah so it is it is important um for i i would say rather the platforms to work with uh secure um networks so that they can provide that security to their end users absolutely yeah provide that peace of mind as well and that extra white yeah. glove service to accompany people <clears throat> to get the best results for what they're looking for right Right. We have another question from Marcella. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, I know Marcella is from Canada, so she's um, a regular listener. So again, welcome. Um, her question is to probably more to Andreas. Will I be able to buy an artwork from WiseArt and then sell it on another platform? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. Hi, Marcella, by the way. Um, so there's, there's a few things we have to consider. First, there's the technology layer. So... Wise Art, where we're currently are working with Casper Labs to bring the, the whole ecosystem to be uh, able to mint and trade NFTs uh, on their chain. But in the future, we're planning to have a, a multi-chain approach with the other, um, you know, big um, chains like Ethereum and uh, Polygon. So the idea is that depending on which chain you're using to mint your NFT, you will have to trade this NFT uh, on this chain. So, for example, uh, if you if you mint your NFT on the Casper Lab chain and you wish to transfer your NFT into a different marketplace, it is important that this marketplace uh, enables as well this chain as well, because um, you will not necessarily be able to uh, transfer this NFT into a different chain. I mean, not effortlessly, at least. So there's the there's this uh, important technological aspect. Um, as well, there's maybe the security aspect. I think that Ashok very explained very well. I mean, obviously, uh, we cannot guarantee that um, if the NFT is uh, exported uh, outside of the platform, that we can guarantee that it won't be um, hacked. Or you know, we we had lots of um, important he headlines from uh, big platforms as OpenSea that mishandled some NFTs that were lost or. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, this this is outside of our reach once it leaves the platform. So this is something that uh, it is important to take care of. Uh, on our platform, we do have KYC enabled, such as uh, every account uh, is verified and every NFT as well is verified and vetted. 
you will lose as well the provenance information that is associated to this NFT if it's uh, going into a more open um, uh, marketplace. Again, like OpenSea, OpenSea, they don't they don't they don't do any vetting, any verification process on your NFT. So you will lose again this aspect if you choose to to transfer. Uh, technically, yes. I mean, we can enable transfer. Um, I think this is something that we still do have to discuss with the dev team for all the uh, reasons mentioned. But yeah, I mean, the answer is still yes, you could, but we will prefer <laughs> that you stay on the market. <laughs> yeah, I, I could add to that a little bit more. You know, um, as and Andreas rightly mentioned, that a platform provides um, much more than just you know buying or selling up NFTs. And that's what he's referring to as KYCs, you know, um, authenticity and all of that. Um, technically, if you own a NFT, it is yours. It is entirely yours. You, you can sell it, you know, whatever way you want or keep it or whatever you can do. It's, it's, the keys are yours. As long as you hold the keys, the, that, that piece belongs to you. Um, but but other aspects are important when you are trading and also access to the market right and if, if a platform provides a certain a, a, a number of users coming to the platform so that you know you're visible and you, when you're auctioning something or selling something you want number of people to be uh, bidding for it and, and that's again something that platform provides you um, in terms of um, Technology uh, interoperability of chains is going to come at some point in time. You know, right now there are technologies which are evolving separately. Uh, <clears throat> so, but but the the core standard that uh, NFT uses, which is called as ERC seven twenty one, is something that is uh, that is being used by everybody. People have made advanced um, you know um, additions to it, like Casper has its own uh, enhancements to ERC-721, but the core standard remains. And um, uh, sooner or later, there will be interoperability of uh, within chains happening. And you know, uh, what you're saying might be uh, easier to implement in that, in that situation. And I hope it helps. Yeah. What about currencies? Because, um, well, like Dinesh's neighbors, uh, you know, invented his own gaming token. Um, like if you're buying on the on the platform or you're uploading on the platform, you're selling with one currency. Somebody else wants to buy from his wallet with a different currency. Is this like you know dollars and euros, and do you just have to have a whole lot of different ones, or how does that work? So, so I mean, you could you could eventually, yeah, of course, uh, exchange the NFTs into different currencies. I mean, one one thing that most traders do is uh, if they don't have the, for example, if I list an NFT to to sell for for one ether and and one of my friends wants to buy it, but they they don't have ether, they have uh, some Casper tokens or they do have some uh, uh, Polygon tokens. What usually people do either is they go through an exchange um, centralized exchange where they can simply trade off uh, the the tokens, being able to process to the to the transaction, or they can do it via a swap function from their wallet. So this is a kind of a smart contract that is executed directly from their wallet. And this enables to very simply and securely uh, transfer and exchange your uh, tokens with someone else that you don't necessarily know, but uh, this is verified by a smart contract and uh, it incurs some cost. I mean, I know, for example, on Ethereum is quite expensive to, to use a swap contract. I will expect that on Casper Lab is much more efficient. <laughs> and, and this is why uh, it's fairly easy. It's not a problem, right? If you don't have the specific token or even, even for payments in fiat, right? Uh, you, you, you will be able to pay uh, either with stable tokens or even with fiat. I mean, if you pay with fiat like uh, Swiss franc, uh, dollars, euro, um, obviously will not go on chain. Uh, you will have to go through like a wire transfer or credit card statement, but it, it's very easy to now to pay with the wallet. Okay. So yeah, then... and it, and it is it is becoming more and more easy, right? You know, uh, you, you can pay um, with your credit card and debit card, and you know, it's fiat on up ramps are uh, commonplace nowadays. I, I I wouldn't say that's uh, going to be a issue uh, at all. Okay. Good. We have more questions coming. It's great, guys, in the audience. Keep them coming. One from uh, Lawrence here in Geneva. When you say that when you buy 
or you transfer your NFT onto an open platform, you might lose the information. Isn't the information on the blockchain? Uh, I, I think I think this is interesting. Uh -huh. I think there's lots of uh, misconception on what actually uh, is the NFT and what the NFT stores. So the NFT itself is, uh, again, as the, um, the acronym specifies, it's a non-fungible token. And it's important to, to really pay attention that is a token. So it is a token that you hold into your wallet. But then what is the image or the video that's associated to it? Uh, what about the problem information? All of this doesn't live on the blockchain, right? Because it will be too costly to, to move around all this information into the blockchain. So what people do and what we do as well, um, we uh, upload this information into an IPFS. It's an interplanetary file system. So what allows you to do is to um, upload all this information and you keep the, the link, right? You keep the link to this IPFS into the token. Um, obviously, there are, there are some problems with this um, in the future. If you don't maintain this link into the IPFS, eventually your NFT can lose this information. You can lose the, either the image or the province information, and then your NFT that was once a, a very cool video is blank. There's nothing. There, there's still a token because the token is actively traded on the blockchain. It will be forever existing on it unless you uh, uh, want to, to burn it. But, but this information doesn't live on the blockchain. It has to live on a separate link. Yeah, Sorry, the, the, yeah. The, blockchain, the blockchain, the um, blockchain, storing anything on blockchain is extremely expensive. Um, so, you know, you, you have certain metadata, as Andy has said, associated with NFT, um, but the bulk of the information is stored outside. You don't lose it unless, I mean, um, it, 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 it's, an, it's, it's a fingerprint of that information that is stored on, uh, which is called as hash, is, is stored on so that you know that there is a one-to-one -one association between uh, the token and the information that you have on outside of um, blockchain. Can you expand a little bit then on the decentralized and uh, now there's a summing decentral land, I think it's called, what, what is that? Decentraland. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not very aware of Decentraland, other than it's. Um, I believe it's a it's a kind of game, a blockchain game where you can own um, digital property. Let's say, like I can own a house or I can own a, a street on Decentraland. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I don't know too much about this project, other than okay. you can trade so those uh, aspects. Yeah. It's just a game that you that is stored on the blockchain. I thought it was something that was a new product. Again, that, um, you know how we're talking about we want to get away from the centralized or the banking system. And so it, we've created this decentralized. So maybe expand a little bit on that. If, it, if the information is not stored on the blockchain, but somewhere else, isn't that the same as being stored again on a, on a, I mean, less sophisticated, maybe a Dropbox or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for example, in the case of Decentraland, um, again, it's a, since it's a video game um, and you have all those assets, right? I can own a building or I can own uh, maybe a country. Um, the, the token itself, this stays in your wallet, but the assets, let's say the images and the environment, the 3D models, those, they have to live, you know, in, in a sort of a database. So mm -hmm. then the question is, how do you store this information? Um, if you store in a, in a Dropbox, for example, I mean, it, it will be... It would be easily um, either you can lose it or someone can access to it and wipe it out the content. So you have to be very careful. That this is why we use IPFS. Um, the the access point is very it's more secure um, in some way. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, and also replicated. So you know you won't be able to just delete the information from IPFS. Yeah. Okay, Ashok, you said we shouldn't lose our keys. What happens if we do? <laughs> oh, it's 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 like getting locked out of your house <laughs> with with no uh, you know uh, locksmith available. So if if you so to, that's one of the very important things that you know you hear people losing their keys and losing you know bitcoins worth millions of dollars. Uh, that's essentially what is happening is 
people are not careful about keeping uh, their keys. So in, in, the, in the decentralized world, you generally work with a key pair. There's a public key and there's a secret key. Public key is the one that you um, announce and you give away to others so that they can transfer things to you. But for you to transfer um, what you have uh, in, in your wallet to anyone outside, you need to use your secret key. That's only known to you. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really important when you generate, um, and I, I, I couldn't emphasize this more, very, very important for you when you create the wallet and when you generate your keys, keep your secret keys really safe. Um, you know, take a printout, put it in the lock, you know, bank locker, uh, copy it on a pen drive. Don't lose it. Don't give it away because that's really uh, like giving giving keys to your um, safe safe box to uh, somebody else, and you know it can be taken from you, and you have no recourse of getting it back. If okay. you don't, ha if you lose your if you lose your keys, you lose uh, your your ownership, essentially. Well, that's scary, huh? <laughs> All right. It, guys. it is scary. If I may add, yeah, it is scary. I think, um, I mean, there are lots of views on how you should handle the keys. Some people say, please don't leave your cryptocurrencies onto an exchange. Uh, you will lose everything. I do think you have to educate the people to understand what are you actually doing. If, for example, you create a Coinbase account and you invest um, 1 million in Bitcoin and you leave it, everything there, you have to understand that Technically, the Bitcoins are not yours. I mean, you did bought them, but you don't have custody of them. Coinbase have the custody of them. So you have to think, uh, it, it, are they more safer in Coinbase custody or are they more safer with you? I mean, I do think currently it's much easier to uh, handle the keys as it was a few years ago. As Ashok explained, we have a lot of horror stories of early users um, storing their, their keys into their hard drive and there, there's a technical malfunction and the hard drive is not accessible. So you have literally a computer worth technically millions or hundreds of millions of dollars, but there's no way to access to the keys anymore. And those keys, they're impossible to guess. Um, they are, I, I believe, a two to the power of 100 different combination of, uh, of uh, keys possible. So, so good luck finding this. This will take you a trillion of years to hack uh, with a computer. So, so once you lose the keys, that's it. As Ashok explained, that's it, you lose it. So the, my main idea, my main uh, takeaway is either you leave it into the custody of someone that you really can uh, trust and trust uh, not to take it from you or not to lose it, uh, or you have to be the soft custody, but then you have to be prepared to understand what is the responsibility behind this. Mm -hmm. And are they like visually, are they very long codes, lines of code? Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, uh, for example, on uh, Ethereum or on Bitcoin, uh, those are very, the private key is a very long uh, string of characters. Um, usually it's it's impossible to remember by 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 memory. Okay. So what what a lot of um, uh, wallets are using is uh, seed recovery. So so instead of uh, having to copy a very long string of maybe 50 or 100 characters that are random, you have to copy um, somewhat like 12 or 24 uh, uh, keywords. So those can be very random words like table or sun or cat whatsoever but the idea is that if you put all those random uh, keywords in the specific order this will generate uh, your private key and then it's much easier to safe keep and you know if, if you mishandle like a, a letter case o with a big letter case oh this is not a problem right <laughs> all right well thank you for all those tips guys we're almost at the end of our webinar if there are any other questions this is your time and um, in the meantime, I'll ask Ashok and Andreas to, to give us some last words of wisdom. Are you ready to go first, Andreas? Uh, yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, so on the, on the subject of NFTs, don't be afraid, right? You, you can come and, and send us a message. We're happy to explain to you how this work. Um, you know, we're very like passionate team about uh, NFTs. Uh, I'm on the technical side. Sixteen is on the artistic side. We work with very cool people like Ashok that are bringing like new technologies, and we're very excited, you know, to to show you what we'll be able to to work together. So, so feel free to contact us. 
Yeah, I mean, um, <clears throat> NFTs is definitely the the, the new technology. Um, it's opening up lots of opportunities, not only for artists, but collect, collector, collectors and users, right? Uh, also business applications like, you know, Casper has marketplace for uh, patents and, and whiskey bar, uh, barrels uh, and, and many other applications. So NFTs is, is a piece of technology uh, that will open up a lot more new opportunities for users. Uh, definitely artists and uh, those who respect art and you know um, want to promote it um, do, do, don't sit on the fence <laughs> come come explore come explore the technology um, I think there is a lot of opportunity here um, and you're right Ashok in saying that it touches not just the art industry or the collectibles industry or the luxury industry it goes you know from Health, the health industry to um, yep. the food industry, yep. the fashion industry. It's really, really a global yep. phenomena. And um, at Weiski, we will, you know, we're trying to do something that is open as well, um, together with the vetting. And we hope to have more quality than quantity, but we will be very diverse and hopefully also help people perhaps set up some white label um, possibilities, but it will go, yeah, from the entertainment industry to, uh, you know, securing uh, yeah. um, digital IDs for football players or whatever it may be. It's very widespread. Again, thank you very much. I don't think we have any more questions. I'd just like to remind everybody that on Thursday, the 16th of December, will be our last webinar for the year. Um, we will be talking more about the advantages there are for artists and museums and uh, collectors to maybe um, use that as an inventory as well of their collection and secure the provenance and the history of their artwork. Um, so in a different um, sort of less commercial maybe aspect of how NFT and this technology can be used. And um, in the meantime, I, you'll get an invitation in due course, all those who registered this time. The recording will be up in a couple of days on all the social media, LinkedIn in particular. So please don't miss it. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you very much. Yeah, you've been a great audience. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, it was fun. Bye.